welcome to Brexit Unlocked. Since June the 23rd, 2016, there have been many dark groundhog days for Brexiteers and Democrats. But today, have we finally seen the breakthrough moment? Is the prospect of breaking free from the soul-destroying shackles of the European project becoming a sweet reality? Just hours ago, Boris Johnson said, prepare to embrace no deal. But as he stopped short of walking away from these pointless and painful negotiations, is this really Europe's final countdown? But before, before we pop the corks, the EU took the fizz out of today's announcement and tried to burst Boris's bubbles. Party pooper Ursula von der Leyen droned, see you in London next week to continue talks. Insiders tell us Michel Barnier has even booked his ticket to London on the Eurostar. So is this really the beginning of the end? Are we about to break free of the EU or is this merely more political brinksmanship before yet another Brexit compromise? With us today to help explain the deal, we have Ben Habib. On fishing, we have June Mummery. On the view from France, we have Charles-Henri Galois. On the reaction from Germany, Sabine Bettler-Spahr. And finally, Britain's most persecuted Brexiteer, Darren Grimes. Well, there's an absolute ton of details to unpick today. So let's go straight to the king of Brexit detail, <laughs> fearless Ben Habib, former MEP and the chairman of Unlocked. So Ben, today, Boris Johnson looked every inch our Winston Churchill and not our Ted Heath. What's your take on that, Captain? Well, I, I, I was hugely encouraged by his declaration today that um, uh, negotiations hadn't led in a positive direction and that we must now be, you know, leaving on WTO terms of what he calls Aussie rules on the 1st of January 2021. But as Belinda said, you know, he stopped shy of saying, I withdraw from negotiations. And I would have liked him to have said that. I would have liked him to have said that actually at this point, after all the bad faith shown by the EU, after all the dragging of its heels, after all the humiliation heaped on us in this country, that he would have said enough is enough. We went past our 30th of June deadline. We extended that to the end of July. We then gave you till September. We gave you till the 15th of October. You're clearly not acting reasonably. And I would have liked him to have sent a very strong message saying negotiations are now over. So Ben, Boris wants an Australian style exit, but is that really possible underneath the withdrawal agreement or does he really need to rip it up for that Australian exit? Well, he really needs to rip up the withdrawal agreement. Um, as you're alluding, Belinda, you know, the withdrawal agreement ties us into uh, EU state aid law via Northern Ireland. It puts a, a, a border down the Irish Sea, um, which actually leaving without a deal doesn't get rid of. Uh, it um, puts the ECJ in charge of huge swathes of British law. And as you'll be aware, the, the Internal Market Bill hit a stumbling block instantly because it runs against Article 4 of the Withdrawal Agreement, which is the provision that puts the ECJ in charge effectively of UK courts. So there's a huge gap between where we are and where we need to be to be a genuinely independent sovereign nation. But if we were to leave without a deal, undoubtedly the task of the Prime Minister would be much easier than if he were to try and fudge, as I've always feared, a, a deal that kind of masked the Northern Irish problem uh, and thereby tied us into close alignment with the European Union. A no deal Brexit right now, even if he doesn't tear up the withdrawal agreement, is by far the best result uh, that we could have. Earlier on today, Ben, we had John Redwood on Unlocked, and he's, he gave us great heart when he said he believes we are nearer to a clean break Brexit than ever before. But I'm hearing a touch more hesitation in your tone, Ben. <laughs> well, it's been four years and a few months since we voted to leave the wretched institution. And here we are still trepidatious with our hearts and our mouths, wondering whether it's ever going to happen. I, I, I'm with John. You know, John and I are kind of completely like-minded. I think he said, tell Barnier not to bother getting on the train. And that's the kind of rhetoric I'd like to hear from hey, ben, our Prime ben, Minister. 
In fact, could I interrupt right now? Literally breaking news now. Adam Parsons, he's a European correspondent at Sky News, has just said UK government sources say Lord Frost has spoken to Michel Barnier and told him not to bother coming to London on Monday for more talks. Well, that is fantastic. Stay in Brussels. <laughs> Live. Well, that is Make fantastic. That. that is fantastic. That's what we need. That's what we need. We need to let the European Union know unequivocally that we're the fifth largest economy in the world, 10th largest armed forces, a member, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. We do not need the EU. We can stand on our own two feet and they should stay in flipping Brussels. That's the talk that we want to hear. Oh, my God, Ben, you know, this week people have been saying Ben for number 10. And, mate, you are starting to sound <laughs> prime ministerial. Look, this is amazing, guys. History is happening as we are on air. June, I think we're going to have to come to you. I can see you're almost throwing your sherry in the air there, darling. Look, fishing, once again, has been absolutely key to this. From the very, very beginning, you've given it your all to the coastal communities in Britain. Nobody has trooped harder or fought a greater battle for Brexit and for fishermen than you. What's your take on today's events? This is bold talk. Will we finally get the Brexit the fishing communities des demand and deserve? Well, I'm absolutely delighted. I really am. I, I, I'm, I, I'm shocked, but I am delighted. I cannot believe what I'm hearing. This should have happened four years ago, but yeah, coastal communities will be able to rebuild and, and the future of our industry, like I've always said, and I will say it again, the UK can be the most finest, sustainable fisheries in the world. Oh, June, what an incredible announcement we've just witnessed um, live on air. I, I'm just oh. thinking, I know, I can't quite believe it because um, no one would blame us for being very wary about pledges and promises politicians make over Brexit. We have been battered and bruised over the last four years, not knowing whether to trust. We've had our hopes dashed. Um, are you surprised that Boris is finally, you know, not all talk and no trousers. He's actually got a big pair of trousers on and he's talking the talk. Um, is it time for celebration? Yeah, uh, do you know something? I'm not that su surprised as in with the fishing. I cannot believe the support my industry has had I mean, the great British public have really been behind the fishing. They realise, you know, that fishing is the UK's most sustainable resource, renewable resource we have. We take a little, we leave a little, and when we go back, there is some more. What government would give that away to any other country? And through this process, I, I, I have most certainly seen even people on the Remain side wanting to take back full control of their waters. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not surprised that fishing won the day, actually, because we've worked damn hard for this and we deserve it. Um, so, yeah, I'm thrilled. You know, it's been incredible how fishing has been front and centre and Remainers kind of belittled this all along. Oh, it's only 0.1% of GDP, but they fundamentally failed to get the point. This is about sovereignty, it's about taking back control, and it's about what could be. Think how fishing could become if it became a fraction of it, what of it was before. But June, I have to bring you onto our good friend, Emmanuel Macron. Mm, He's yeah. been giving it the big end this week, talking about the fact we are certainly not sacrificing the interests of our fishermen. June, have you got a message for Monsieur Macron? Well, yes. Au revoir. <laughs> Au revoir and Femme la porte. <laughs> you know, you know, Mr. Macron, he, he, they are in trouble, that food. They, they know that they are going to lose a lot, actually, the French are with fishing. But, you know, hey ho, the same thing happened to us back in the day. Oh, you know, our boats were scrapped. Um, our, our coastal communities were absolutely annihilated overnight. You people lost their, 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 their families, you know, work. So, no, I don't feel at all sorry for the French on this one. I think they're being absolutely ridiculous. Their little stunt that they did recently, uh, firing flares at our fishermen, was so uncalled for. Silly, silly move. You know, they played right into my hands. Mr. Macron, I thought, there you go. You've just proved... 
they, they don't really, they don't care about the, the UK. They, they, I get the fact, you know, people say, well, they do fight and stick up for what is theirs. I admire them for that. They do fight the French. You know, I have to hand that to them. In fact, I wish, you know, our government and our people were a little bit more like that at times. But no, so no, I think that the French have got to realise that, um, you know, they can't do that anymore. And if the French enter UK's waters, where they no longer have fishing rights, they would be pirates. They'd be pirate fishing and breaking international law. So, you know, enough of that. They're gonna to have to stop doing that. Well, June, do you foresee though, lots of trouble and strife in the waters between French vessels and British vessels? Those awful scenes we saw of about 20 French vessels surrounding two British boats, throwing frying pans at them because they're in there scalp uh, scallop waters yeah. do you foresee much trouble after the announcement now that we are walking away do you think there'll be more fights in the sea yeah i do i think they'll they'll, they'll try that on i mean you know let, let's face it when i when iceland realized that they, we were making lots of money off the back of their um industry they had to fight for it for a time being you know we have to be strong you know you've got ais you've got satellite you know, people say you're going to have to have border control. You will have to have it control. But this satellite game is, is so good at what it does. You'll know if their boats are coming in to our waters. And if the, and if the French then decide to block, to block um, sails over there, you know, the French would be damaging their own economy by blocking British fish from being exported. Um, they'd just be cutting off their nose to spite their face mm -hmm. because, um, you know, just think of the number of fresh processing factories there are and employees to pay they need the raw material yeah it's interesting how we've just seen a message from um, Angela Merkel who has said to Emmanuel Macron drop your hard line on on fishing yeah. Yeah. and Macron has been the sticking point all along by playing it tough on those coastal communities and I just feel delighted that this posturing Napoleon uh, has finally had a taste of his own medicine. But I wanted to ask you, finally, I'm going to ask all of the guests this. Um, first, I'll come to you, then I'll come back to Ben Habib. June Mumry, have you got a message for Boris Johnson on this, this historical day? Yeah, um, good for you, Boris. You know, I'm glad you've actually grown a pair and doing your job. That's what you've <laughs> elected to do. So, yeah, well done, Boris. Keep up the good work. And if not, we're coming after you. So, no, uh, yeah, I'm pretty good. I think, I think he's realised, you know, that we are a strong country. Great. So, Ben Habib, I saw you guffawing away there in the background we, about Boris growing a pair. You've been saying this for some time. Ben, um, should we be getting too excited or should we be calming down a bit? What's your message for Boris? Well, you know, you travel and hope, but you have to prepare for the worst. So, emotionally, I'm not going to be punching the air uh, unreservedly until we get to the 31st of December. But what Boris should now be doing is picking up the ball that he's got and planning positively for no deal. Actually, the United Kingdom's future is brightest with maximum divergence from the European Union. All you need to do is look across the channel to see what a failure their policies are. And so we must now ditch their laws. We should ditch their regulations. We should cut corporation tax, cut VAT, impose tariff on German imports, make Britain a nimble, fighting, independent nation and get on with it. Put Britain first. Well, absolutely <laughs> fantastic stuff, Ben. Thank you. So on to our next guest, Mr. Generation Brexit, President of Generation Brexit. We have Charles-Henri Galois. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming, Charles-Henri. I would love to ask you, what is the reaction in France to Boris's bold statement today? In France, uh, you know, you had Macron uh, reaction, uh, which was totally stupid because he said, I don't understand Boris, uh, the UK has more to lose than the EU uh, for no deal. But I, I don't think for a, a bank man, uh, Macron doesn't know the figures because if you look at the, the trade exchanges, the, actually, the European Union has uh, 85 billion trade surplus with, uh, with the UK. Or for France, it's 12.5 uh, billion euros trade surplus with the UK. So I think that the European Union has more to lose uh, than the UK for no deal. And I'm not that confident, that confident about Boris because I think 
maybe you won't have a no deal because I think it's putting pressure on the European Union. The European Union will or may cave in uh, before December 21st because you, you have seen the reaction of Angela Merkel. She is very worried about uh, no deal because it's Germany that have made a major surplus, trade surplus with the UK. And I'm sure that after the Boris announcement, she had a call from the car industry in Germany and they have told, they have told her, you yeah. need to have a deal. Okay, so um, I think that Macron has completely overplayed his hand here because let's face it, he was playing hardball on fishing and a no deal will mean no access to British waters for France. Now, what will that mean for Macron? At the moment, his opinion polls are on the floor. Here's a guy in trouble. What will a no deal mean for him? And what about the possibility of an increase in the chances of Frexit? For France at a global level, I mean, they, they talk a lot about the, the fishing part, but actually, if you look uh, for France, it's only on the Atlantic side, on the channel, it's only 19% of the French fishermen turn over. So it's not the same for Belgium or New Zealand, it's almost 50%. So they will be more in trouble. And actually, France, if we, if we were sovereign, we can uh, have access at 100% for our own waters. And the issue is that we cannot compensate it so far because we will have the Belgium and the, the Dutch that will come to fish in the French waters. So we have actually the same issues as, as that you had with the, the French yeah, Sherman and Sun. And then for, for Frexit, definitely, I think if Britain is out with a good deal or with no deal, it will, it will be a great momentum for all the countries within Europe that want to, uh, to take their freedom back, that want to take back control. And I think about France and Italy. So we, we may have a very good surprise about it. And for France or for, for Macron, let's say, uh, opinion polls, I think it's not the, the fishing industry, the, the most worrying part. It's more about the, the other thing because it's, it's only uh, 171 million euros, the fishing, uh, let's say, turnover in the UK waters. It's more all the rest. And if you have a no deal and the UK decide to increase, for example, uh, the, the customs right, it may be uh, much more uh, harmful for the French economy. So it will be with the COVID consequences plus uh, a no deal. I think it will, uh, it will uh, hurt all, uh, all, the, all, all these fields that uh, export to, to, the, to the UK for UK as a more, let's say, a protectionist policy. Thank you, I, absolutely. I, I was um, talking to Martin earlier just about how Macron is facing um, an election in 2022 and how much of his sort of theatrics was an attempt to appeal to the nationalists in France, you know, standing up for the fishermen and things like that. Um, has that worked in the French media and how has the French media taken to Boris's stance today? Is it, is it supportive? Does it attack Brexit? No, I think they attack Brexit because uh, as in the EU, the, the mainstream media in France, they fear that the Brexit will be a success and that it will give ideas to the people to do the same. So they are more on Macron's position to say uh, it's very uh, dangerous what Boris is doing because a no deal will, will be a catastrophe for, for UK. So they have all this narrative, but then you have the narrative and after that you have the facts. And I think it will be definitely uh, okay for the, for the UK and within uh, some years we will uh, benefit from that. Okay, so I'm gonna push you. I know you're a politician and you're very good at dodging questions. Has the likelihood of Frexit increased today? It's, it's too soon to, to do it. I think it will increase after the real result of Brexit. Today, just a, uh, an announcement. And uh, as I said, the, the mainstream media, they say it's very, it will be very hard for the UK. So they are still in, that na in this narrative. Okay. And what advice would you have to Boris if you could speak to him now on how to play the next week with the EU team coming over to continue talks in London? 
I think he should he should stay tough, and I think that if he stays tough, at the end you will have Germany that will force the European Union to cave in and to 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 give everything, almost everything, let's say that Boris asks, and maybe you you could even finish with a good deal. Well, super stuff, Charles Henri, always an inspiration. Um, now remember, guys, you've got to get involved in this debate. Use the hashtag Brexit Unlocked. Now, that's a nice segue into our next guest. You're saying there that this will increase appetite in Germany to split apart. Who'd have thought that? <laughs> the absolute pillars of the European Union all along have been Germany and France. Next guest, Sabine Bepler-Spahl, chair of the think tank, the Freiblick Institute in Germany, a Brexiteer who has written a book on the topic, a columnist for The Spectator, Sabine. How have Boris Johnson's threats of a no deal been received in Germany today? I don't know exactly how they've been received officially, but I do think that the German establishment is um, shell-shocked. They're very, very worried. And I think that one of the um, things people have to know is that the hardball the EU has been playing is actually covering up a lot of fears. And I think if Boris does what he has promised, and um, fulfill his promise to, to, to the people, to his electorate. I think that's gonna be a great boost for everybody who has been fighting for democracy within Europe and within the EU. And it's not gonna go unnoticed in Germany at all. Um, so I think, you know, and it's going to unleash a very important discussion, which is going to be away from Britain probably, and much more towards what's happening in the EU and what's happening in our own countries, which is you know, greatly needed because at the moment they've been getting away with murder, always looking only at Britain and British problems without actually addressing the problems we urgently need to address here. So Sabine, you wrote a book on Brexit. Um, why was it so important to you to write about the UK's journey out of the European project? Well, it was actually, I decided to write it in December 2016. I'd been observing the Brexit reporting in Germany for over half a year. It was a response to the media coverage, which was entirely uh, a, a remain bubble. So I think most of the German media, I would say 90%, except for some odd you know, outside media um, outlets were very, very much on the remain side. And they weren't actually reporting or telling the story of Brexit at all. It was impossible for normal Germans to really understand what was happening. They were not following, not able to follow any of the, of the more open debates in Britain. I felt I was privileged because I was able to follow these debates. I had contacts in Britain and I thought it would be my responsibility to do, to inform people of what was actually going on. But the other reason was I was also astutely aware that much of the disdain which was poured upon Brexiteers in Germany by the, uh, by the press was really not directed at Britain and not directed at, at you lot, at, at the Brexiteers. It was actually directed at the German electorate. It was a, a warning to the Germans saying, don't do what the British have done. Don't even think of actually questioning uh, the EU. So it was actually a, a reaction of fear to, the, to, to Eurosceptics within our own country. And I found that deeply unfair and I thought somebody has to you know has to react to it and somebody has to tell the story of Brexit and show you know what wonderful debates were actually taking place in Britain and you know how much this was uh, an expression of a wish for democracy and freedom um yeah yeah well, well Sabine first of all thank you you know for, for sticking up for Brexit and Brexiteers from a German perspective and one of, the, one of the amazing things about what we've been doing on Unlocked when we've been speaking to our friends in Europe, because we love Europe, we just don't like the European Union. And when we were MEPs out there, we were meeting so many German Eurosceptic MEPs and they said the same thing to us. And it was this, the Germans are watching Brexit. And if it's a success, then the appetite for Germany leaving based on data and evidence will increase. Is that a fair representation, Sabine? Uh, I, I, there was a kind of an interruption there, but um, yes, I think it is true. And I think people are watching very carefully what's happening in Britain. And that's why I, I believe uh, whatever you do, you have to be very aware of the fact that it's not just uh, a, a, British, um, a British matter. 
um, I think the um, you know the the Germans know very well that the future is going to be pretty dim and pretty dismal. So there's a lot of time bombs developing at the moment. The state debt in other countries, um, the euro skepticism skepticism which has grown over the years. People have developed a tremendous cynicism of what's actually happening in in on the, in the EU level. We've had um, Mrs. von der Leyen elected despite her being one of the most unpopular politicians in Germany. Um, we've had the Euro imposed onto Germans against their will uh, a long time ago, but people haven't forgotten. So all of that is just sort of uh, still around in the debate and just waiting somehow to erupt. There's no really clear Eurosceptic movement in Germany yet. So it's kind of um, uh, focused on certain parties. The AFD is certainly one party, but the left party too. I believe that the Brexit, the, uh, the referendum has probably focused a lot of um, opposition in Britain and has actually made the fight against the EU much more um, disciplined, much more focused. We haven't had that in Germany. We've never been allowed a referendum at all. Even though Germany is such an important central country in this whole matter, the German people have never had a say. And for good reasons, because the politicians know that if they did give a referendum, it would really probably unleash um, something which they would find very hard to get under control again, which is a very strong Eurosceptic opinion. Yeah, no, it sticks in our throat a lot, actually, that Eurosceptics across the EU may never have the chance of voting in a referendum to leave the project now because of what's happened with Brexit. Um, I wanted to ask you, Sabine, in the EU, is there a real denial that the UK is going to be a sovereign, independent country? Um, John Redwood said this morning in a tweet, Mrs Merkel still doesn't get it, that UK voted to be a fully independent state and the EU still wants control over us as if we have not left. Do you think the penny will ever drop? Well, I do think they understand it very well, and that's why they are playing hardball, because they are very aware of what this would mean. They're very, very scared of the EU breaking up. They're, they're saying we're talking 27 countries with one voice, and they know exactly that's not true. They know that there are massive um, tensions within the EU between East and West, North and South. So they're very scared. And Merkel has actually said that last year. She said, um, you know, there is a real danger that Brexit poses a danger to the EU breaking up. There's also a very strong fear of um, a competition outside uh, the EU's border developing, um, Britain becoming more flexible in relation to trade deals, in relation to customs. Um, the EU hasn't done very well at all. We've heard it. We know that we are, uh, Germany is already in a deep recession. There's really very few countries which are doing very well. If the EU was a dynamic, um, uh, you know, positive uh, institution with real economic growth, they wouldn't be so defensive. And I think actually Mrs. Merkel knows very well what's happening, but it's her worst nightmare come true. Um, the German establishment has for so long depended so much on the EU for many different reasons, mainly ideological reasons, I would say, but maybe also economic, but I think the ideological reasons are at the center, that they're very, very afraid of this whole thing breaking up. Good. Um, I know I shouldn't gloat at the, at the misery of others, but I'm afraid, Sabine, I find it very hard to, to cry a river that Frau Merkel has finally woken up. She's finally heard Boris Johnson's trumpet blast in her ear. We mean this. We mean business. We always did. Before we sign off from Germany and move on to Darren Grimes, who's been waiting very patiently in the wings, what's your message to Boris Johnson to be? Well, my message is, as I said, I said, um, do what you promised. Remember that you're sending a strong sign, not just to your own electorate, which is who you are responsible to. But don't forget that this is history in the making and that people might look at you from outside of Britain too, you know, with admiration if you do what you're told. My message is also basically to you lot, actually, because you've put your prime minister under pressure. You have fought for this. And I think, you know, you deserve a lot of solidarity. And that would be what I would say to my German um, uh, co-comrades saying, look at the British, take heart, 
you know, there is a way of breaking up a very undemocratic structure and we might, you know, have a try and have a go as well. Well, you know what, thank you for saying that. It really means a lot to us because it has been often a lonely place. Um, I know before we come to our next guest, Darren Grimes, um, often a very, very lonely place resulting in legal action even. Isn't it wonderful, Belinda, just to hear supportive voices from the continent about what we're doing, about the joy of democracy, and just that solidarity, just marvellous. And actually having that responsibility, not just to the UK and British interests, but, but to the democracy across Europe. If Brexit succeeds, it will inspire and give hope to all the movements out there that are battling against the muscle of mainstream media and pro-EU fanatics that don't want you to have a voice, that don't want you to have a referendum. We stand in solidarity with you. In fact, every European that, that holds democracy as precious as we do. Thank you for that. Yeah, fabulous stuff. So finally, and this is the, the headline act. I joked earlier, I hope Darren Grimes is gonna blast some dry ice onto the stage and come running on. He's had a very, very busy week. Darren Grimes, the director of Reason UK, another fabulous media channel of contrarians, free speech, speaking out um, the, the debates where others fear to go, like ourselves, please check out Reason UK and Britain's most persecuted Brexiteer, a young lad who's found himself at the centre of two big storms now. And I think, Darren, uh, welcome to the show today on Unlocked. It's been, I think, an amazing outpouring of support towards you um, from the media, from Brexiteers, from Conservatives, from Democrats, from those with common sense. We love it a bit, Darren. But first of all, before we get into your tribulations, mm -hmm. and by the way, fire away questions on the hashtag Brexit Unlocked. I wanted to ask you, um, Darren, you, you, you tweeted very um, favourably today. You went, that's it, we're out. Mm. when Boris spoke. Do you still believe that, mate? L listen, well, first of all, thank you very much for having us on the show. I'm a big fan. But look, I'm absolutely delighted that Boris Johnson and Team GB have finally tested positive for backbone. You know, after <laughs> years of Mrs May, what an absolute delight it is to hear these announcements today. You know, for Barnier to be told not to bother getting on the train and save European taxpayers the bill. That's delightful. You know, I think we all hoped deep down, didn't we, that economic reality would, would win out in the end and that the EU wouldn't cut off its nose to spite its face and act instead in the interests of all 27 members by agreeing to a, a mutually beneficial deal with its most important ally. But listen, we all knew that that wouldn't happen unless we have the courage to actually walk away from that table and send a strong message that, you know, to business has to start preparing because even if we there is a mutually beneficial deal. Leaving the EU single market and customs union means that businesses have to change. And I think it's really important that the Prime Minister trumpets this loud and proud. And if the EU wants to act like a protectionist racket, well, crack on with it, mate, because we're not having anything to do with it anymore, are we? No way. Um, I wanted to ask, were you surprised by the EU's reaction to Boris's statement, especially Ursula, who was just mm. sort of very blasé, whatever, Boris, we'll see you on Monday. Talks are going to continue way past your deadline. That was the sort of response. Were you surprised by that? No, I wasn't actually. And I think Sabine put it really well. Uh, I've, I've heard Sabine speak in the past and she's very, very eloquent on this, which is that there's a sort of, a German stitch up, isn't there, with, within their establishment to just one, deny people any say over their relationship with the European Union and the sort of the way in which they act as the ultimate cash cow. You know, they have the biggest teat that is consistently milked within the EU. And the EU citizens are just, uh, German citizens rather, are just not given a say over this. So I'm not surprised that a deeply unpopular politician who's been made EU commissioner is there, uh, is saying these things that aren't in their interest. They want to keep the EU together at all costs. I'm afraid that what we're witnessing right now is going to split them and it can't come a moment too soon. Well, I mean, I'm not surprised that you weren't surprised because I was about surprised at, at their damp squib reaction as I was surprised about them leaving votes early and getting an extra croissant. They're an absolute <laughs> disgrace. And I'm sorry, I don't give a monkeys about them just like you, Captain Grimes. Now then. Let's move on. 
let's go back to your tangle with the Electoral Commission. Now, ourselves at the Brexit Party found ourselves mm. during a live election, I thanks remember. to Gordon mm. Brown, um, weaponizing the Electoral Commission against us. They put their boot through our door. They got involved. They stuck their nose in your business as a Brexiteer with a lot of sway. Darren, is the Electoral Commission fit for purpose anymore? Well, Martin, I see that the chairman's been dismissed after one term, and if they need a new one, I've I've said I'm more than happy to do it. But um, you know, look in in his judgment, in my appeal, uh, his honour Judge Dite preferred the submissions of a crowdfund. You know, I crowdfunded my legal team on the true facts and the law to those put forward by the Electoral Commission, even though it instructed at vast expense to the taxpayer, city solicitors, James Eady, who's the treasury devil, and two junior councils in a, an attempt to sort of rescue it at vast expense. And in a damning judgment, Dyke found that the commission hadn't understood the bloody law exists to uphold. You know, I'm firmly of the view that the commission, uh, this goes to the very heart of the sort of problems with the Quango state. And I think an important point that I would ask all of our viewers tonight to take away from, from that saga is that democratic engagement has to be open to all, and that includes Brexit party candidates. You know, if ordinary people, which many Brexit party candidates were, of course, are fearful that they risk being penalised by a biased regulator, if they you know, do something wrong, and that could be, you know, not being popular with the FBPE crowd on Twitter, the regulator that risks become an impediment to participation in our democratic process. And let's not forget that British politics relies entirely, well, in large part at least, on volunteers. And the Electoral Commission cannot, this biased quangle, cannot put that at risk. So I think it's good, actually. And this is another way in which I will back the government. They are doing the right things, I think, on reform of these institutions and trying to roll back the long march through those institutions. Well, I also think it acts as a warning to our European friends if they are ever representing a Eurosceptic party, just to keep an eye on these institutions and what they might be prepared to do to silence Eurosceptic mm. um, politicians or candidates over in Germany or France or Italy, because you've seen it all happen here first. Um, Darren, I wanted to come to you about um, the police summoning you for an interview um, after comments made by one of your interviewees, David Starkey, on your show. Um, mm. I wanted to ask, why is it okay for police to interview you, but not interview, say, comedian uh, Sophie Duca, I think that's yeah. how you say her name, when she said, kill Whitey, or Yasmin um, Alaba. Alaba Brown. Brown. Oh, God, yeah, I'm going to get old friend, Yasmin Alaba Brown, who <laughs> thought, thought Donald Trump put a racist bully on the Jeremy Vine show, a show that I go on often with Yasmin, who is always abusive towards me. How come um, that you're getting your collar thrown by the police, but they're not? It's an interesting question. Listen, I, I mean, I vehemently, this will be no surprise to you, statement of the week, eh? but I vehemently disagree with Yasmin Alibi Brown and, and Sophie. And they, you know, so uh, Yasmin especially only seems to be wheeled out to say racist things these days for the clicks. But, you know, after she did that interview the other day with Jeremy Vine, I wondered if Jeremy would face criminal investigation for allowing her to say those things in a similar way that I have. But Look, whether it's Alibi Brown or so-called comedian Sophie Duca, in a free and democratic society, guys, we've got to back those underlying principles of free expression and freedom of the press. The best way, in my view, to tackle underlying prejudices or injustices isn't by arresting people or threatening to do so. The best way to increase resistance to uh, ideas that you you know you you sort of don't like and want to combat, as we saw with the likes of Nick Griffin back in the day, is through more speech. So creating a chilling effect of that speech is a real hamper and impediment to actually advancing as a society. You know, speech and dialogue is how you actually advance a society, not vexatious 
claims and wasting police time in this way. And I agreed with your tweet earlier, Martin, you were absolutely spot on. I think that people should stop wasting police time because they're offended. You know, let's actually investigate crimes, not grimes or thought crimes. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really chuffed with, you know, in, you know let, let's police crimes, not grimes. Uh, you know, I, I used to work in a tabloid, it, it's a sin. And fair credit to you, mate, because you also tweeted um, about the Kill Whitey saying, the Kill Whitey comment saying, no, 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 the police mustn't now regulate speech and debate. And I think that's one area, Darren, where I guess our side mm. is winning. We don't mm. want to be snowflakes. We don't want to cancel people. I think when we start playing that game, when we go down to the level of those kind of people, then I think we lose. And I think free speech, and I'm sure you would agree, is in a very, very perilous situation right now. I, I, I supported you this week on Mike Graham's show on Plank of the Week. We made the Metropolitan Police the planks of the week for coming after you. Because quite frankly, if we live in a society where, where the police are getting involved in what journalists say, that is a country I no longer recognise as Britain, Darren. I think you're absolutely right. And listen, isn't it fascinating and really quite telling that everyone from a communist like Ash Sarker, who I don't think any of the panel tonight would have any areas of agreement with, to a Liberal Democrat like Tim Farron, you know, they're taking issue with the police decision to investigate me for the offence of stirring up racial hatred. What a horrible thing to be accused of, which falls under the Public Order Act, an unprecedented use of that act to regulate debate and speech and you know they're not alone in that view the former director of public prosecutions lord mcdonald he told the times that that was the actions of the police are sinister and foolish and deeply threatening in free speech so i think you're absolutely right to highlight the fact that free speech is under attack like certainly it, it never has been in my lifetime and we've got to resist those the sort of woke arati who want to be offended by everything and use the police to try and get those whose views they don't like resist mm -hmm. it entirely because it sets a really dangerous precedent what a waste of police time yeah. and money. Yeah, I just want to make one final point that before Belinda asks you for your thoughts and your comments towards Boris Johnson. And that I think is this. I think, you know, what's happened to you has been a, a stark wake up call um, to people who should defend free speech. Come together. Um, I know often one of our faults, if you like, is that we tend to work in isolation. We tend to work in silos. But I think actually there's a huge opportunity here to come together and defend free speech. And you're quite right. Ash Sarkar, I don't get on with. I go on TV with her. She doesn't actually buy it. You know, she, she's all right. But the point is, if people are coming together because um, they recognise that Twitter is, is, is wagging the tail of the police and they're going around putting their boots through doors and terrorising people for, for being journalists, for being politicians, scaring people not to get involved in the first place, we've gravely, gravely lost control of where this is going. So hats off to you for what you've done this week. Belinda. Yeah, massive respect there, Darren. Um, yeah, I wanted to end our questions on a Brexit note, just because of how exciting today's mm -hmm. announcement was. Um, so what is your message to Boris? He's obviously going to be still continuing the talks next week with Barnia. Um, what would you say to him? What advice would you give him for next week? Well, I think just look at the reaction that you've had from the... Uh, the likes of us you know and I think some people in this in this conversation tonight have been staunch I, I I think advocates of anything that the opposite basically of what Boris Johnson and the government have been doing as far as the withdrawal agreement is concerned yet tonight we are all his most fervent supporters and he is really banging the drum for Team GB. And as I say, finally testing positive for backbone. And I think he'll have the British people on his side if he just turns around, continues this mantra of saying, we're gonna stand up for British interests. We're actually gonna do what is in the national interest and stand strong because eventually, I think economic reality will win out. You know, Eventually the EU will come back to the table and actually offer us a deal that it's signed with other countries who it doesn't have as close a relationship with. This is clearly the EU cutting off its nose to spite its face. Let it do so, stand strong, stand tall for Britain and we'll get there. We can do this. We are a bloody great nation. And I think it's about time we had leadership that really showed that.
Well, they're arousing words. Now then, guys, I'd like one quick fire question to all of you in turn before we sign off. And I want you to give a mark out of 10. How close are we to a beautiful, pure, clean, wonderful Brexit? 10 being the dreamland. Zero being tied to Frau Merkel's chains as we sink to the bottom of the channel. Ben Habib, marks out of 10. Oh, well, I was at two or three yesterday. I think I'm up at six, which sounds mean, but for me, that's a huge swing in the right direction. I've just been so chastened by four and a quarter years of fighting for Brexit that, uh, um, you know, I can, I, I get to six and I'll get up to eight if he delivers. Well, Ben, that's the most positive I've ever heard you, so that's definitely <laughs> exciting that, 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 news. That, that, is, that is like the Grinch suddenly smiling at Christmas. Anyway. <laughs> yes, June, can you give us your scores out of 10 for today's news? Well, I've been at zero because I've always thought that he was going to throw fishing and coastal communities under the bus. But today I'm delighted, so I'm not going to get too excited, but I'm probably, I'm going to go for a seven. Well, that's, that's enough. And I know, you know, from, from our experience in Brussels, just how difficult it was for you, June. Um, all of us Brexit Party MEPs voted for this withdrawal agreement because we had to place our faith in the electorate, the 80 seat majority, in David Frost, in Boris Johnson to get this job done. So I'm remaining, the, I'm, I'm, I'm saying cautiously, glass half full. So how full is the glass of champagne in France? Charles Henri. Marks out of 10. 10 for a beautiful Brexit, zero for disaster. What's the scores on the doors? You know, there is a British motto which says, uh, wait and see. So I, I will tell, uh, I will put a six and I, I hope for you definitely that you, you will have a 10 uh, at the end. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Charles Henri. And Sabine, from a German perspective, how do you think we're doing? Closer to a clean break? I think uh, I, I'd, I'd go for eight because I'm an optimist and I think it's a make or break situation for uh, Boris Johnson. He knows exactly if he doesn't do this, he's out. He's, you know, he's blown it. So I'd go for eight. Well, this is one Eurovision that we're finally winning. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great Britain is finally winning a Eurovision yeah. contest. No it's been decades <laughs> and we're never going to win the real thing because now they all hate us because of Brexit. Final word of the day. Mr. Grimes, the scores on the doors with 10 being Brexit, beauty and zero being disaster. Where are we at, Captain? Listen, I'm at a nine, actually. I'm normally oh, like Ben. I'm normally quite pessimistic. But, uh, you know, I, I actually i am really encouraged by what we've heard this week. So keep on keeping on. Look, it's been a fantastic show. And, you know, there have not only been many dark days in Brexit, but sometimes even on Unlocked, we've had to steal ourselves or a bit some moments where we've kind of given up a little bit today wonderful set of guests who are really yeah. flying the flag for brexit absolutely and you know covid has um had a lot of airtime, understandably but we were so worried it would take people's eye off the ball just at crunch time but our viewers and all the supporters and brexiteers have stayed strong and kept the pressure on boris and it's worked so well done everyone fingers crossed next week is a more compromise yeah keep those fingers crossed those legs crossed everything else crossed Thank you for tuning in tonight to Unlocked. Thank you to the Daily Express for hosting this on Facebook. If you like what you see, please share, please like, please subscribe, follow us on social media, get involved, tell your friends about it, because right from the start, we've harnessed people power to get this job done. Thank you for watching Brexit Unlocked. Have a great weekend, and let's keep our fingers crossed. We could be on the verge of history. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>